tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It won't be the flipping of a switch. We're going to be proceeding carefully. BC's restart plan. By the long weekend is the time that we will be able to go out and, and hug our family. Small gatherings allowed as the province eases COVID-19 restrictions. Also. Moving in everything, especially in the summertime. From restaurants to hair salons, the plan to allow customers to come back and. It's a lot of work. It's quite complicated. Don't expect a full scale return to the classroom until the fall. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Small dinner parties, backyard barbecues and hugs with family are set to return to BC just in time for the May long weekend. Haircuts, elective surgeries and dentist appointments might be available again within weeks. The provincial government has revealed its gradual reopening plans in the midst of COVID-19. We have team coverage of that plan tonight. Tina Lovegreen on what it means for our schools. And Dan Burrett will look at how and when restaurants and other businesses will likely allow back customers. And we begin with Tanya Fletcher live, breaking down the stages of this reopening. So Tanya, in uh, 10 days, we'll be able to expand our personal bubbles. That's right, Mike. Very exciting indeed for many people. And just in time for the May long weekend, that is when we will be able to expand our social circles to include more family and friends. And here's what else we can expect to reopen with that first phase to come in mid-May. So as we mentioned, those small social gatherings, we're told between two and six people is kind of the sweet spot. Elective surgery dentistry, physiotherapy, they'll all be set to resume, along with youth uh, sports and recreation leagues as well. Uh, we'll also lift the ban on in-restaurant dining and hair salons. Of course, those were sectors uh, that were ordered to close, and they'll have to submit industry-specific plans for approval before that actually happens. And we're also having uh, guidance for retail stores and office workplaces. Now, as for details on how expanding our personal bubbles will look like uh, come the middle of May, well, it's up to your discretion really the premier is appealing to you to use good judgment we are not prescribing to British Columbians who they interact with and how they interact with them only to say that the best way to protect everyone is to observe social distancing be sure you're washing your hands regularly Mother's Day is coming act responsibly be comfortable with your family keep the gathering slow and use your common sense now, phase two will roll out over the summer, and here's a look at how that will work. So firstly, we'll see hotels and resorts start to welcome people back come June. Parks for overnight camping as well will happen in June. Uh, we will see provincial parks open for day use mid-May, but June is when we can see overnight camping. The film industry, specific to domestic production, is when we'll see for June and July. Uh, movies and symphonies will happen in July as well, but no big concerts. And schools will uh, come back with a full kind of relaunch at least modified in September. Okay, Tanya, what about people thinking of returning to work? What are the rules for office spaces? Yeah, so here are the recommendations for workplaces considering a return to the office. Uh, so firstly, we'll see temporary physical barriers as the first recommendation. Also, frequent cleaning of high-touch areas. We'll see uh, staggered hours and shifts is a suggestion, and also avoiding those in-person meetings. The big one here is don't come to work if you're sick, especially if you're showing any COVID symptoms. The ban on large gatherings of more than 50 people will be in place indefinitely. So that means no nightclubs, bars, casinos, no concerts, conventions, or any of those live audience professional sports or, or even international tourism. So what about faith gatherings? Well, John Horgan suggests there is a way for religious services to perhaps resume in a modified way. Most uh, temples, most churches are large facilities. Uh, you can have a number of people appropriately distanced. You can have multiple services throughout the week. You can't have 50 people jammed into a small space, but you could have 49 people spread through a larger space, particularly when it comes to things like uh, uh, gatherings of uh, particular religions. And by the way, we are about to hear more from the Premier come tomorrow. John Horgan is holding another joint news conference in the morning to detail specifically the resumption of elective surgeries. Anita, Mike? All right, Tanya, thanks very much. Tanya Fletcher reporting live tonight. All right, so what exactly is happening with the plan to get kids back in the classroom? Well, the province's announcement is still leaving some confusion today. Mm -hmm. Tina Lovegreen is live now outside Elsie Roy Elementary in downtown Vancouver to help with the breakdown of what we can expect. So Tina, what uh, have you learned about this? 
Well, Mike Anita, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a mother of two. She has two sons, and she said the best Mother's Day gift would be if they announced that all the kids are going back to school. Well, that did not happen. Kids won't be going back to school, that full-blown back to classrooms until September, but there is going to be a measured approach back. And I know this sounds a bit confusing for some parents and students, but the idea is that a small number of students will go back to classrooms, perhaps on certain days and starting with certain grades. We've seen virtual learning taking place over the past number of weeks, uh, positive outcomes there, but it's not perfect. We want to make sure we can do a dry run between now and the end of June, or pardon me, the, uh, the beginning of June to the end of June. We're not anticipating any increase in, in class teaching until well after uh, the May long weekend. So the details of exactly when that will happen are going to be announced in the coming weeks and the details on exactly which students will be going back to school again coming in the coming weeks. So not a full blown back to school until September, you know, but perhaps adding to those, you know, 5,000 students that are already in classrooms, the children of essential workers and students with complex learning needs. And, you know, even when we go back to school in September, things are going to look incredibly different. Expect health and safety protocols, daily screenings of students and staff, frequent cleaning, frequent hand washing, and smaller class sizes, increased space between desks, and even alternating attendance. So a lot of careful planning needs to go into this before um, schools are back and running, says Terry Mooring, the BCTF president. Things will look really different. Like, you know, parents won't be coming into schools to drop off their students in their classrooms, for example. There'll need to be a lot of uh, safety protocols put into place. And that's what we're working with government around. As for sports and recreation, they are trying to find ways to have those kid camps, those summer camps running this summer as, you know, sports that are less contact and are, are, are taking place outside are obviously considered safer. As for hockey resuming, they say they'll look into that in the fall. Mike, Anita. Thanks, Tina. Tina Love Green reporting live for us tonight. If you are waiting to get back to work at a store or you're in desperate need of a haircut, the middle of this month just might be your time. But expect to maintain physical distancing and to make more appointments. Dan Bird is live with more on this part of the restrictions. Dan, can businesses and customers, what can they expect? Well, as you said, Anita, be patient and keep their distance. The province now says hair salons, personal services, uh, retail stores, restaurants and others can reopen in the middle of this month, but both workers and customers have to follow some rules. Take a look. For retail stores, the government wants more checkouts and barriers to help space people out. It's encouraging online shopping and that people in store use and wear masks. They're requiring people to book an appointment for that much needed haircut or a spa treatment. And they want businesses to remove or at least shrink their waiting areas. Now we know one area that's had big concern is restaurants. They've had to move to either takeout or delivery. No dining in. Thousands of staff are laid off. Just spoke with the head of the BC Restaurant and Food Services Association. They're aiming for a June 1st reopening. They've developed a plan and they think they'll be able to do that. People can expect spacing out, masks being worn by some staff and no lineups at the front. Smaller places like Cuckoo Cafe here in Yaletown hope they can reopen their patio which attracts a lot of their customers. Sounds like the, uh, the Premier has indicated that uh, as long as we uh, follow the guidelines by WorkSafe BC and we still practice social distancing, I think, uh, yeah, I think we can open up. Yeah, I'm looking what would it, what would, yeah, What would it mean for you to be able to reopen your patio? What would it mean? Oh, it would mean everything, especially during summertime, because we rely on uh, our patio to be, you know, uh, full customers enjoying, you know, nice sunny days. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it now. Mm. I hope so. Has it been? So that's what Michael Long is hoping for. We're in fact here at Cuckoo Cafe. It's closed now, but he's hoping that this patio can be open with the proper physical distancing especially since he's relying really right now just on the loyalty of his neighborhood customers, hoping to get more visitors. But again, for customers and workers and employers, it's going to be a very different experience, whether you're going to get a haircut or going to dine in at a restaurant soon. Anita, Mike. All right, Dan, thanks very much. Dan Burt, live downtown tonight.
Okay, a lot of new information to digest and you probably have a lot of questions. So today we are doing a live Q&A with Dr. Mark Lesician. He is the Deputy Chief Medical Health Officer at Vancouver Coastal Health. He'll be joining us to answer your questions on how to navigate life in the next phase of this pandemic. Our lines are open. Call us now, 604-662-6801. You can also email us at any time at CBC. And if you are watching on our Facebook or YouTube live streams, you can post your questions in the comments section. And today's reopening announcement comes as the volume of new cases continues to drop. There were still three more people who have died of the disease today. The province's total now standing at 124. All three deaths were in long-term care. There were 23 new cases, meaning BC has now recorded 2,255 confirmed cases of COVID-19. Across BC, 74 people with COVID-19 are in hospital, 19 of whom are in intensive care. Nearly 1,500 people have recovered from the disease. Well, if you were planning to tie the knot this summer, is your wedding still a go? As many as 95% of those nuptial plans are hitting pause, but event planners are eager to work with the few clients they have. As Bell Puri of the CBC Impact Team reports, conflicting messages from the province has made that tough and that the rules are open to interpretation. Wedding plans have become more complicated than ever for couples not ready to postpone marriage. We never pictured like face masks being a part of our wedding day. A big July wedding is off. Dan Gillis and Laurel Weens are left with hopes for a small September event planned around COVID-19 restrictions and physical distancing. We never would have thought when we were planning a wedding for like 130 people, 120 people that, you know, you have to make like a guest list for 75 people and then 50 people. A lot of our our plans are a plan A, B, C, and D. Like we have multiple plans. We have different guest lists. Event planners wonder what they can or can't offer clients. The lack of clear guidelines has been really tough for us. On one hand, it's no more than five people at a ceremony, according to the BC Centre for Disease Control. On the other hand, gatherings up to 10 times as big are okay, according to Provincial Health Officer Bonnie Henry. Smaller is better. Outside is safer than inside. I would like to have her say specifically, if you have an event under 50 people, you have to maintain the six feet social distancing, end of story. That sort of precludes a wedding from happening. Aaron Bishop isn't advocating for lifting restrictions, just clarity and rules in writing. We get into a sticky situation of having to be the bad guy um, and say, no, I don't think that's what we're supposed to be doing right now. Virtual weddings have become a new option. You can have a ceremony, you can make speeches, you can dance together, you can eat together, you can do all of those things, but you're not all together physically in one space. The package includes delivering catered food to guests across Metro Vancouver. The ceremony will happen here and up to 98 friends and family will be up on the big screen. Hi there. But in the words of Dr. Bonnie Henry, this is not forever, this is just for now. Because in the long run, even people in the industry don't believe that virtual weddings will replace the real thing. For now, it's a glimmer of hope for an industry that's lost 95% of its business in recent weeks. I think we crave the intimacy, the hugs, the connection that we have with people. I think this is the best way to achieve that in the time being. Um, and I think there is a place for both of those to merge in the future. But for now, we'll do this until we can get back to the real good stuff. Belle Peary, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, Vancouver's Oppenheimer Park isn't very pretty these days. There are big piles of trash, temporary fences are sprawled out all over the grounds, and yes, there's still lots and lots of tents there. But as Jesse Johnston reports, outreach workers say in the middle of the mess, there's progress to be made. There's a new routine at Oppenheimer Park. Every day, 15 to 20 people move out of their tents and into a temporary hotel room provided by the province. But of course, we know people will always look for community. Then Stephanie Allen with BC Housing says a new fence goes up. The fencing is a way to prevent other folks from coming in to this space um, when we know that due to the evacuation orders that that's not uh, permitted. The fences are here to prevent a repeat of what happened last year when the city tried to dismantle the camp. Many people left but returned a short while later. The province says that can't happen again during the COVID-19 crisis. And outreach workers say they're much better prepared this time around. 
this uh, movement of people from the park would have looked uh, remarkably different without the work that our staff have done here on the ground, establishing trust relationships. Outreach workers say the move has gone well since the province enacted a public safety order last month. Fader says most people seem to be willing to leave by the province's deadline of May 9th. And for those who don't want to leave? At the end of the day, if somebody chooses not to leave, that's their own personal autonomy and, and that's their decision. Uh, we're not here to force anybody out. We're here to cooperate with them to, uh, to help them find safe space. It may not look like progress from outside the camp, but outreach workers say the proof is in the numbers. More than 175 people have been moved from the park and surrounding area to temporary housing. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Vancouver. Many businesses have had to rethink how they operate to survive through the shutdown. Some have managed to stay afloat, but will still need to keep operating in new ways indefinitely. Briar Stewart reports on how one Vancouver business is coping with loss and adaptation. This is a look at a business operating in the COVID-19 world. Vancouver's Ernest Ice Cream is pumping out 2,400 pints a day while its four shops remain shuttered. We laid off 70 people um, right, right off, off the bat. That's three quarters of their employees because the biggest part of their business, the hands-on task of scooping ice cream for customers, is no longer safe. They shut down their entire retail business for a few weeks. Working well with Shopify. Then they decided to launch curbside pickup with the skeletal staff spaced out through the kitchen. Right now, they're only making half of their normal revenue. Knowing too, we still have rent and bills that are that are happening at, at the rest of the shops that are that are closed. Yeah, it's it's definitely unnerving and a little frightening. Even as provinces move to lift some restrictions, businesses are in limbo, trying to decide whether to open or even if it makes financial sense to do so. We normally have projections that are pretty accurate that take us through the course of our year. Uh, we had to just throw that out the window and, and start from scratch. All right, here's your ice cream. The co-owners say they've received lots of community support. Thank you so much. Customers are able to pick up pints without coming into contact with anyone. But there is a lean summer ahead. Gone are the days where ice cream craving crowds spilled out onto the streets. We have, you know, seven or eight people just scooping ice cream behind the bar. So it's really hard to maintain physical distancing. So hopefully we can reopen our shops in some capacity, but I don't think it will be in the way that we've operated in some years past. Instead, they plan to keep their stores close to customers, but offer cones from the curb. It's all about adapting because right now, there's no indication of when it can be business as usual again. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. And Premier John Horgan had some strong words today after an increase in anti-Asian crime in our city. Hate has no place in British Columbia, period. We need to stand together, united against that type of racism whenever we see it. COVID-19 does not discriminate. British Columbians shouldn't discriminate either. Vancouver Police recently released details about two separate incidents last month. In one case, an Asian woman who was at a bus stop near Granville Street in West Pender was punched in the face by a man walking by in what seems to be an unprovoked attack. Police say there was a separate altercation, April 22nd, where an Asian man was attacked outside his home in East Vancouver. He suffered serious injuries. A group of concerned Canadians of Chinese descent is troubled by the spike in violence and believe anger toward Asians is misguided. We can see that those are entirely irrational behavior. Well, I think they, they simply blame the Chinese Canadians for causing all this devastation, whereas they shouldn't even blame Chinese people from China. In early April, the Chinese Cultural Center windows were defaced with what Vancouver police call hateful graffiti. Police say 15 crimes involving hate were reported to police in April. 11 of those were anti-Asian. Well, the puck dropped today at the Burnaby Winter Club Arena for the first time since COVID-19 forced the facility to close. And it's the first arena to reopen in the Lower Mainland.
But while the arena may now be open, there's a number of new physical distancing measures. No team practices, only private lessons with a maximum of five people on the ice at one time. Athletes need to show up in full gear no more than 15 minutes before practice, while dressing rooms and stands are closed. You know, we feel very confident that we've went above and beyond. You know, our separation gaps is not just two meters, it's actually three. Every one of our chairs and our cubicles are nine feet right now. So, you know, for us, it just, it's the right time. Um, our members deserve it. He says the club received about 150 emails from interested parents within the first three minutes of reopening. There's ice there. There was ice. That's the only place we're going to see it, though, uh, because things are warming up, I guess, Brad. Anywhere down here in the lower mainland over the next couple of days. Admittedly today, though, that we had a bit of a brisk northwest wind coming in, so you may have noticed that. But aside from that, it was really a pretty sunny day. And I want to show you this just kind of on the satellite and radar imagery right now to show you that we only had showers kind of first thing in the morning, and that was also from overnight last night. A few thunder showers actually took place in places like Burnaby and over to North Vancouver. But as the day went on, the clearing conditions, yeah, that was our main story. Temperatures right now, as we look at it at 6 o'clock, Pacific time dealing with about 15 degrees and that is bang on seasonal a little cooler as you head out toward hope but in general not a lot of heat was present here in the lower mainland and in fact if we play the game of the warmest spot in the province we need to go really far north and east the heat was located in the BC Peace region so Dawson Creek getting up to about 19.4 degrees but the warmest spot in the whole country rather was going to be in Alberta just on the other side of the border now when we look at a quick look ahead for the next couple of hours no real change in the precipitation story meaning it is going to be clear throughout the overnight tonight and really sunny conditions all the way through tomorrow so we're going to be dealing with lots of sunshine as soon as you wake up lasting through the day and it is going to be here all the way through the weekend and i'm going to have that full and complete story when i come back okay brett thanks very much and a reminder you can watch this newscast live on cbc gym the free app is also where you can find other cbc programs the cbc vancouver also on facebook youtube and instagram and you can follow both of us on Twitter and Instagram as well. Once again, we are taking your questions, and while well, you probably have a lot of them today, Dr. Mark Lesition with Vancouver Coastal Health is here just after 6.30. Call us 604-662-6801 or send us an email. And thanks for staying with us online for more COVID-19 coverage during the TV commercial break. While a kindergarten teacher has launched a website to help kids during COVID-19, she says it's easy to overlook kids' mental health needs with everyone focused on the pandemic. So as Greg Ross tells us, she's created a space where kids can find messages of hope. Ever since Toronto schools were closed in March because of COVID-19, kindergarten teacher Ashley Bigelow has had concerns about how her students are dealing with all of these changes. Kids' mental health is, you know, a huge need and it's not really discussed as much as a lot of people would like, would like it to. After reading that calls to kids' helplines had drastically increased in recent months, she decided to launch a non-profit site with one simple goal. To reach as many kids as we can that are going through really uncertain times. So we know that there's a need there and just to let them feel heard and let them know that whatever that they're feeling is okay and that we're all in this together. With the help of her friend and marketing expert, Greg Fretz, they came up with the name thegoodviral.com, as opposed to the bad virus that is forcing everyone to stay home. The good viral is something that spreads positivity, uh, it pays it forward, it spreads joy. Um, it is completely grassroots, nonprofit. It's just, you know, uh, people sharing with other people, messages of hope and encouragement. They share those messages in videos that are posted to the website and social media. But you have had some pretty high profile people that have responded and left messages. Yeah, we have. Um, just before this interview, actually, we had uh, uh, Julian Wright, a former NBA player, played for the Raptors, uh, submitted his video. Uh, we've had Junkyard Dog, former Raptor. I want to send a message to all of you out there locked in the house, but still getting your schoolwork done. Hey. We're going to make it through this. We've also uh, had Hal and Joanne McLeod. During your time at home, we'd like you to take the body break challenge. 50 jumping jacks, 50 push-ups, and 50 sit-ups. But it's not just celebrities. 
it is um, a platform where kids can also hear words of hope and messages of hope, but can also contribute and inspire kids around them. Like five-year-old Micah, who was so inspired by the messages, she shared her own. But we could still see each other by having video calls and playing on the video call. Bye, I love you. And while the website was launched because of COVID-19, Bigelow and Fritz say there's no reason why it can't continue when this is all over. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. It's a great idea. Obviously uh, resonating with the kids. For sure. Mm -hmm. Good. A reminder now, we are taking your questions on COVID-19 and BC's plan for a new normal. Later this hour, we're talking with Dr. Mark Lasician, Deputy Chief Medical Health Officer with Vancouver Coastal Health. Our lines are open. Call us now at 604-662-6801. You can also email us at any time at CBC. If you're watching on our Facebook or YouTube, you can submit the questions in our live stream. It seems like there are just uh, COVID stories these days, but there's a lot of other news happening, and we're going to get back to some of those stories in just a couple of seconds. Stay with us. A fire at a scrapyard on Mitchell Island sent smoke billowing into the sky this morning. Around 2.45 a.m., firefighters rushed to the industrial island in Richmond. It took an hour for around 20 firefighters to put out the blaze. And although there were reports of explosions, fortunately, no one has been hurt. Vancouver Police is seizing more than $3 million worth of street drugs following a lengthy investigation. For four months, police were looking into the flow of illicit opioids in Metro Vancouver. Then, uh, on April 29th, five search warrants were executed in Vancouver and Richmond, turning up fentanyl, cocaine, meth, cannabis products, and cutting agents. Along with the drugs, police seized eight handguns. I would consider this a significant seizure. As you can see, a number of very dangerous firearms have been taken off the streets. This is also a significant amount of fentanyl that's been seized and the drug continues to be at the core of our ongoing opioid crisis. This is probably the most fentanyl I've seen in one spot in my 24 years of drug enforcement. Eight people were arrested, later released though. Over police said the investigation is ongoing and charges will eventually be recommended. At CFB Trenton today in eastern Ontario, a solemn ceremony took place to honour six Canadian Armed Forces members who were killed in last week's helicopter crash. As Kayla Hounsell reports, despite the pandemic changing this ritual of a dignified service, the grief was still the same. It was a repatriation ceremony unlike any Canada has seen before dignitaries wearing masks to protect one another from COVID-19. And in the shadow of the aircraft, six hearses, although there is only one body, Sub-Lieutenant Abigail Cobra. Her brother is also in the military. I lost a sister by blood, but I also lost a sister in the forces. As he made the trip to CFB Trenton, he recalled his last conversation with his sister. I would always say I love you at the end, so... Uh... It kind of proves even more that every person you talk to that's uh, meaningful to you, you should always end the phone call with an I, I love you or kiss and a hug when you see them. Cobra's grandmother, unable to make the trip, watched the ceremony from home. We're very proud and happy that we have Abby home. She's a bright, bright light, loved by so many people. The other five are still missing and presumed deceased after the helicopter crash one week ago. Their service hats carried by colleagues from HMCS Fredericton. Their families given time to pay their respects. There isn't a day goes by that I don't think about them and continue to mourn with them. So many mourn with them. Sub-Lieutenant Matthew Pike, honored by his friend's mother today. My son is on the Fredericton Lee Alley, and I'm here in respect for him and for all of his shipmates because Matthew was his friend. It was his roommate. They trained together. This was their first deployment. Um, we are so proud of them. They are all heroes. The ceremony was followed by a procession along the Highway of Heroes, one hearse for each life lost. For Abigail Cobra's grandmother, it was important to say their names. Captain Brendan Ian McDonald, 
Captain Kevin Hagen, Captain Maxim Miron Moran, Sub Lieutenant Matthew Pike, Master Corporal Matthew Cousins, and Sub Lieutenant Abigail Cobra. Thank you for your service. Rest in peace. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. And still ahead tonight, Dr. Mark LeCision with Vancouver Coastal Health will be here live to answer your questions. A lot of information from the province today on the next steps and the easing of restrictions. Give us a call, 604-662-6801, or send us an email. And thanks for staying with us for more news coverage during the television commercial break. Well, some university students are in limbo with businesses shut down or employees working from home. As Heather Gillis reports, many summer work placements have been canceled. So I recently just lost my work term. Janine Callahan is a fourth year Bachelor of Commerce student at Memorial University. She's required to do three work terms to graduate, but her final placement has been canceled because of the coronavirus pandemic hard it was very scary callahan says her work terms have been valuable learning and networking opportunities really gained some incredibly strong business relationships that i value even things as simple as microsoft excel you don't realize how much you really learn in school until you get out and you have to apply it she isn't alone about 30 other commerce students have also had their places cancelled and it would have been the work term where i um started interacting with clients in a professional manner and would have had more exposure to some of the more challenging aspects of the accounting job. Isabel Dostelaire is the Dean of the Business Faculty. Yeah, we're losing uh, work terms from week to week, uh, so, so it, it really is a concern. She says some professors have stepped up to hire students and Munn's Centre for Entrepreneurship has created some positions to help them meet graduation requirements. If we have to sacrifice a work term, it's not impossible, but we need to make sure that there's some learning that comes out of it. She's reminding students there are always opportunities in business. Look at what's happening with a company like Zoom. Meanwhile, Janine Callahan is hoping businesses will take advantage of federal job subsidies to hire students. If you qualify for the federal funding, please look into it and think about hiring a work term student. As the pandemic continues, businesses fold and the job market tightens. The business dean says it may be a good time for undergrads to consider staying in school. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it can be kind of hard to make out what people are saying underneath protective masks these days. Well, imagine how much more difficult it is for those with hearing impairments or people who need to read facial expressions to understand what's being said. They need to see the whole picture, not just moving from the hands and the, the sign language. That's why teachers at this school for people with special needs in Belgium have come up with an innovation, stitching a transparent window over the mouth section of a cloth mask. They say it helps ease the anxiety that is widespread in this pandemic. Hearing impaired students think it would be helpful for shop clerks and others to use it as well. The mask takes about 30 minutes to make and a Belgian charity has put together a video complete with instructions. All right, lots of uh, questions, no doubt, today after the uh, province's uh, restart plan was announced. And we have somebody joining us live in just a sec that can uh, answer those questions and other COVID-19 uh, questions. Our Q&A with Dr. Mark LeCision from Vancouver Coastal Health is coming up in just a couple of seconds. Stay right here. When it comes to COVID-19 in BC, we have seen a declining number of cases. And today, the Premier unveiled plans for reopening our economy. The easing of restrictions will be gradual in phases. But as Renee Filipponi explains, BC is going further than many provinces. It's a glimpse at their future many British Columbians have been waiting for. I'm saying we have a plan to move to what will be the new normal. And we're going to be taking guidance along the way from British Columbians. Expanding social circles is top of the agenda. Small dinner parties or barbecues with fewer than six people by Victoria Day long weekend. 
Even hugs will be okay, as long as no one is showing symptoms. We're not prescribing to British Columbians who they interact with and how they interact with them, but people have to make those choices. BC has successfully flattened its curve, with the number of new cases trending downward. Virtually all sectors of the economy will start to reopen, as long as there is an approved plan to do it safely, with physical distancing and personal hygiene measures. The coming weeks will see a return of elective surgeries and other medical services like dentistry, physio and massage therapy. Personal services like hair salons will be able to reopen. So basically we'll have a walkway here to come behind the table. Restaurants could also be serving soon, though no date has been set. Oh, I'm already open tonight if necessary. <laughs> but just in a small scale. This restaurant owner says he wants to move carefully. I don't want to open full force, bring all my staff, opening all my shift, etc., uh, to possibly shut down in two weeks or three weeks if we have another wave of COVID. For now, there is little detail on what's next for schools, only that there won't be a full return until September. If infections remain low, hotels, resorts, and some overnight camping would open in June. The film industry could start back up. Even movie theaters would be an option this summer with fewer than 50 people. And until there is a vaccine or a successful treatment, there will be no large gatherings. That means no concerts and no sitting in the stands to cheer on your favorite sports team. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. And to help us understand how some of the new changes will unfold, we have Dr. Mark Lasician, Deputy Chief Medical Health Officer for Vancouver Coastal Health. Thanks so much for being here today, Doctor. No problem. Uh, there still seems to be a lot of confusion around the province's unveiling today. Uh, let's start with the physical contact rules. The Premier says he isn't telling us what to do, what not to do. What do you say? Hugs, gatherings, take us through what your thoughts are around what you heard. Well, I mean, different people have different risk tolerances, and so people are going to be willing to do different things depending on their personal risk factors and their comfort with risk. You know, we do know that cases and hospitalizations and outbreaks of COVID-19 in our region have come down dramatically, and we see very few cases that we can't link to other cases. So, you know, we think the general risk in the community now is low, and we think it is time to start increasing people's social circles, to start having people access services, go to businesses, do things like that, uh, to kind of get back to a more normal way of living. So is it safe for someone to send their child to a, to a summer camp or to a sports camp or something like that in the coming months? Well, we're gonna have to see what those type of camps look like. Um, they're probably not gonna be the same camps that we used to offer pre-COVID, uh, you know, they'll probably be more likely to be day camps and they're going to have to probably think about the different activities that they do at those camps. But I think it will be possible for kids uh, to go to camps, to go to community centers, uh, to do, you know, recreational activities this summer. It's just that some of those activities might be different. Catherine called in to ask, uh, she says, I'm a hairdresser. What PPE will I need to be able to do my job? Well, there are some businesses like uh, personal service establishments that are under provincial health officer orders, uh, restaurants or other, or other businesses like that. And so um, when the provincial health officer re relaxes those orders, there's going to be specific guidance for those industries in terms of how they need to serve the public and you know keep themselves safe as well as their customers. So uh, that I think there's going to be more to come on specifically what those industries need to do. Do you feel like today was, you know, we, we learned a lot, we, um, we learned all about the phases, but do you feel like there's still a lot of um, things that are unclear here? I think there is still questions and I don't think it's a, you know, flipping on the switch. I think it's a dial that we have to start opening and then we, you know, see what happens in terms of our cases and make sure that we're able to follow the cases that come in. You know, we think a lot of things can be open now. We've been trying to advise our, our partners that, you know, outdoor environments are really quite safe and that parks and playgrounds and beaches could be open. And so we're going to see those start to open. We think that a lot of community amenities can also be open with modifications, you know, community centers, libraries, arts and cultural spaces. A lot of these places can be open, but some planning is going to have to happen to, to make sure that people can maintain that physical distance around themselves at most times. 
Yeah, because how do you keep up the emphasis on safe behavior when you have nice weather and you talk about parks and beaches and things like that opening? What do you suggest? Well, the physical distancing recommendations are re recommendations to the public. So it's up to people to manage that themselves. And some people will want to manage that very strictly uh, because they'll really want to keep people away from them. And other people will be more willing to allow other people into their social circles. And we, we think it's okay for people to make those choices at this time. You know, lots of people can be at parks and beaches at the same time, and they can still be socially distanced from each other or, you know, little clusters of people from other clusters. And so we're going to start seeing more and more of that, and we think that's okay. Joanna called in to ask, uh, the swimming pool is the best physical therapy for me. When do you think we'll see pools reopen? And let's broaden that out a little bit. I mean, even if people are going out in the summer, warmer weather, things like that, is it okay to go in a pool? Yeah, I think pools have always been safe environments uh, in terms of disease transmission. You know, we chlorinate the water specifically so pa that pathogens can't be spread from one person to another in pools. So, um, you know, pools and other indoor recreational facilities, ice rinks and, and things like that, gyms, you know, they can start opening now. It's just they may have to modify, you know, the way people come in, for instance, inter interact with staff, the way people go into the change room, because those environments are a little bit uh, smaller. And so they'll have to make sure that there's not too many people in the change room at one time. But, you know, pools are big environments. And so uh, there is a lot of room for people to uh, be distant in pools. There is some concern today that if we start opening things up, we will see a second wave. And, you know, Dr. Bonnie Henry has talked about that as well. Lisa Watt on Facebook asks, what's the chance that second wave will be really bad as we reopen? Yeah, I mean, uh, the reason why we can open now is because cases are very low. We also have great testing capacity that we're not using right now. We're getting, you know, where there's a lot less respiratory illness in the community. And so not as many people are coming to be tested, but we can actually test a lot more people. And so this is one of the criteria for reopenings that we had to have that testing capacity. We've built it and now people can access it. We also have good public health capacity where we can do contact tracing to, you know, isolate the case, find out all their contacts, isolate them before they spread illness to anybody else. And we have the capacity to do that right now. So even if there are additional cases, we feel they can be controlled. And we've learned a lot from this first wave. And so we think we can prevent uh, you know, the second wave from being anything like the first. Sal wants to know um, what you know about the reopening of fitness facilities, when that's going to happen. Is it safe for people to start going to the gym? Yeah, well, in our region, fitness facilities and gyms have actually never been closed. The provincial health officer didn't issue any orders closing those. Some regional health authorities chose to do that. We didn't see a big risk in those types of facilities. So they were actually never closed in our in our region. And we've been providing advices to different gyms and fitness facilities that they could be open now. It's just that if they want to open, they just have to think about their procedures because their customers are going to want to follow those social distancing um, recommendations. And so they have to make sure that there's not too many people in their space at, at, at any time. And they have to make sure people have access to washrooms and hand washing facilities. Because, you know, when you're in a, an environment like a gym, the way that you might get COVID is not from somebody, you know, sneezing or coughing right in your face. I mean, that almost never happens. It's from touching a contaminated surface and then, you know, touching your face. And so the way that you protect yourself from that is by washing your hands. You know, we, we need cleaning to happen too. But um, no amount of cleaning is going to protect you from that possibility of contamination through surfaces. So that's why people need to wash their hands. Can you talk about where we're at with testing? Lionel emailed in to say, you know, a common cold can leave us coughing for weeks. Can we get tested to be sure it was a cold and not COVID? And you can broaden that out. I mean, when and when not should people get tested? Well, right now we have what we call universal testing. And so anybody can be tested for COVID. Uh, you know, at the discretion of the physician, but we recommend that people be tested even if they have extremely mild respiratory or constitutional symptoms. So anybody with those cold-like symptoms at this time can be tested, and many people are coming forward to be tested. And of course, most of those people now don't have COVID. We have time for a very quick question from Robin. With parents returning to work, what will be the status of daycares and what rules will they have to follow? Well, daycares have never actually been closed during this pandemic. Many daycares decided to close because of staffing issues or other concerns but you know kids are very unlikely to get covid if they do get covid uh, they don't have serious illness and they're not 
involved in really a lot of COVID transmission. And so that makes daycares actually quite low risk environments. And so we think they can be open and many are open now and operating safely. And uh, we know that those it'll be important to get even more of them open so that people can return to work so that businesses can open up again and, and society can get back to uh, some version of normal. Dr. Mark Lasician, thank you so much for being on the show today. No problem. Well, if you're feeling anxious about a return to, well, somewhat normal, you're not alone. How do you go back and ensure your family stays safe and you survive mentally? That's coming up. And at 645, you are looking at a live shot of, looks like Burnaby over there. Sunshine and warmer temperatures in the forecast. Will it last through Mother's Day? Well, we will find out next from Brett. joins us now and I know yesterday I jumped the gun a little bit I thought that the sunny weather was coming right away but we had a blip now can I say okay we're in the sun stretch 
<laughs> yes, you can confidently say that. There's going to be no more rain in the forecast, and I can confidently say that, until essentially next week. So in some ways, that's going to be good to kind of brighten our spirits. Of course, being mindful of the fact that we do need that rain. But yesterday when I signed off, if you were listening, I was mentioning about how I encourage people to wear sunscreen. And today, I wanted to show you why that's the case. Because as we get closer and closer to the sol summer solstice, the solar angle is getting stronger. That means tomorrow, May 7th, the sun rays that we're going to be feeling might as well be the exact same ones that we're seeing on the other side of the solstice in August. So would you normally put sunscreen on in August? Probably. So keep in mind that as we're going through these next couple of weeks, inching closer to the official start of summer, these strong rays are going to be sensitive or you're going to be feeling those on your sensitive skin. So it is important to be covering up if you're outside. And in fact, if you look at the UV index for Vancouver, it is going to be 7 tomorrow. And if you go out to Abbotsford, even stronger, it's going to be at about 8 there. So something to keep in mind, always good to be sun smart as we go ahead. Now, especially because over the next few days, we're still going to be largely dominated by high pressure. That means relatively clear skies and, of course, the warmth that I've been talking about all week. This is going to be building steadily as the next couple of days go on. We're going to see that already into the north. We saw that today, but it's going to be getting even more intense as we go on. You can see Prince George there getting up to about 19 on Friday. But watch this. Come Thursday, we're going to be dealing with temperatures just above seasonal but Friday, places like Abbotsford, potentially 27 degrees, Port Alberni, 25 degrees, and much of the south coast is going to be feeling anywhere between 5 and 10 degrees above seasonal. Now, there is, of course, no real rain in sight at all. As we go through Thursday and Friday, these are going to be really sunny conditions. Lots of temperatures up above seasonal, as I said. Come the weekend, and for Mother's Day especially, we're going to be dealing with some of the warmest temperatures Vancouver will have seen all year long. These, again, are conservative at this point in time. I'm looking at potentially 23 come Mother's Day with only a few high clouds expected. Now, late on Monday, getting into next week, there is going to be some indication that we'll go through a bit more of a pattern change and we will get back to those showers. So there is a good balance between the sunshine and the showers, and I think it's going to put a smile on quite a few people's faces. All right. Loving those double digits in the 20s. Thanks, Brett. Well, as we prepare to reopen our economy, it's not just businesses, but employees who are preoccupied with how to return to work safely. Christine Burak has more on the anxiety some are feeling with just the thought of going back. Ellen Schultz feels cut off from her family. She's tired of living in a bubble. But like many dental hygienists, she's also worried about going back to work. Some nights I can't fall asleep and I'll wake up at two, three, four in the morning Thinking about it, it seems the closer I get, the more anxious I get. A recent survey found a quarter of Canadians want to return to their regular work schedule. The rest prefer to work from home more often or only go into work when needed. I think it's probably majority of us, if not all of us, have a certain degree of worry or, or anxiety. Doctors say most of us have the same questions. Is it safe to go back to work? Does my employer have the right protocols and equipment to keep me safe? And could going into work end up affecting my loved ones? I think it's important to open up those discussions, normalize those uh, reactions, uh, and say, let's hear about those concerns. I can't find any masks anywhere. Esthetician Catherine Hay runs her own business. She can stagger appointments, but treatments are often face-to-face. -face. She's not sure how to manage the risk of asymptomatic spread. I'm really hoping to get some guidelines from some experts on what to do. The question I think at this moment is, what is acceptable risk here? And, and I think that goalpost is shifting. Is that all right? Leading experts say employees can do a basic risk calculation based on their age and underlying health conditions. But it's up to public health officials to figure out how to keep society safe. Guidance that comes centrally from essentially from the government that is entrusted with the public good is where we should be. The dental office where Schultz works has an infection control plan, but she'd sleep better knowing she doesn't have to go back until all public health officials agree that it's safe. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Baby Archie's parents have released this video to mark his first birthday. Coming up, how the social media post did more than just mark a happy milestone.
our lives are rapidly changing, when the news affects you most, we're still here. Stay calm, stay informed. We're all in this together. I'm clapping for all of us. There's so many essential workers. I want them to be seen. Turn on your radio and join us as we bring you a little companionship, community, and connection. Weekday mornings, beginning at 5 a.m. Prince Harry and Meghan released a new video of their son on social media today. Yeah, kind of hard to believe time flies. It was to mark little Archie's first birthday. Look, Arch, that's the cover. Let's go to the next page. Wait, listen, did you hear that? I heard duck sounds. Quack, quack, quack. Wait, wait. Quack, quack, quack. Wait, wait. Quack, quack. He is a cutie, and that was Harry's voice in the background as he was recording his wife reading one of Archie's favorite books called Duck Rabbit. First birthday post is also meant to promote a Save the Children campaign called Save with Stories for Kids and Parents Stuck at Home During the Pandemic. The family now lives in Los Angeles after Prince Harry and Meghan stepped down from their royal duties at the end of March. Barely get to see Archie. Everyone always loves a good Archie photo or video. Everybody loves Archie, yes. Hard to believe a year, though. That's, uh, time flies. Time well. flies when you're <laughs> sitting at home during the pandemic, well, he's, I he's, guess. He's been a bit of a global nomad as well, but <laughs> traveling all over the place. No kidding. All right, that's uh, all the time we have. You can always find this newscast uh, online, cbc.ca slash bc. Dan Bird is here at 11 after the National. Have a good night.